Hello and welcome to part 2 of creating your own custom JavaScript WYSIWYG rich text editor text area replacement from scratch for enhanced text input in your site applications. Okay, so you have your HTML form and all of your JavaScript calls ready to go, which has all been discussed in video 1. Now all you need is your JavaScript file that powers the application. So go to File, New, JavaScript. Let's go to Save As. Now once you're in the directory where your parse file and your form is, let's create a new folder that's called what you see is what you get. WYSIWYG. Then we'll double click inside of that folder and this JavaScript file that we're about to create is going to be named WYSIWYG. WYSIWYG. Save. And you can remove, if you're in Dreamweaver, you can remove that line. Now you can see in video 1 we placed a connection to our WYSIWYG.js file. So already in the head tag. Then there's certain elements within this HTML page that are calling on functions within that JavaScript file. Okay, WYSIWYG.js. In this file, you're going to see a JavaScript method being used a lot named exec command. And exec command has command identifiers for doing things such as, but not limited to, bolding, making links, coloring things, inserting images, and formatting text. So let's take a look at the full list of command identifiers that we can use with exec command before I show you how to apply the ones that we want for the particular JavaScript WYSIWYG we're creating for this tutorial. Now I'll just keep blabbing away as you guys scan this list with your eyeballs. And the ones that I have highlighted in blue and underlined here are the ones that we're going to be demonstrating within this tutorial series. Within this video actually. We're going to knock all of these out the blue underlined ones. And then you guys can do further research on your own to implement all of these things if you want to experiment. Exec command is one of the methods associated with the rich text editing feature of browsers where it executes a command on the target document, a target document element, or the given selected range of text that a user has highlighted in an editable content container. It's also supported by all current major browsers. So what we'll do is go through the HTML file we made in video 1 and start scripting out the JavaScript functions that its elements call one by one. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please watch video 1. Now within our HTML file, the first JavaScript function being called to run is this iframe on function. So that's the first one we'll build. Let's just copy that, go into WYSIWYG, and let's type in function iframe on, open your function with a curly brace, and then go down a couple of lines and close it off with a curly brace. Now let's go into the HTML and count exactly how many functions that we're calling. That one, there's another right there, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then the submit form function. So that's thirteen. So we'll go back into the WYSIWYG.js and we know that we need thirteen functions. So let's just go ahead and make those shells or skeletons for those functions. So we'll copy that one, highlight the text, control C, and then control V, down another line, control V, and just do that till you have 13 in place. Now you guessed it, you're going to change the name on all of these iframe on functions down here to where only the top one is called iframe on, and the rest have the corresponding names from this HTML file. So let's put I bold here, I underline goes next, and I'm going to do that for all of them. Okay, so you can see I have empty function shells set up for all of my function calls that this HTML file is going to execute. The iframe on function gets this line of code. And what we're doing is we're targeting the rich text field in the document and we're making its design mode property equal to on. That way people can type in it. If you didn't do that, people wouldn't be able to type in it and edit the content that's within it. So you're targeting the iframe because in the index file you can see our iframe has the ID and name of rich text field, not our text area. Our text area has a name of my text area. So in the WYSIWYG file, we're targeting the rich text field. That's the iframe. Design mode on. So in the iBold function, we have this line of script. And here we start using that exec command method. So we target the iframe, we use the exec command method upon it, and we set the proper parameters that we need. You can see there's three parameters going into that method, and the identifier is bold. The command identifier in this case is bold. 
Now for the I underline function, we're going to have this line of script. We're going to target the iframe once again, use the exec command with the command identifier of underline. The I italic function, same thing. Now for the I font size function, you have to get a value from input, some kind of input for the user has to use to give you a value of what size that the font is supposed to become. So we're going to use two lines of script. And let me explain those to you now. The first one is creating a variable called size. And that's equal to a prompt window. So do you guys remember in part one when I was showing you the final finished product of what we're going to be creating? You saw those prompt windows coming up where the user can enter in information. That's what that is. And after they enter the information in and press OK, whatever they put in is placed into this variable called size. So then we just run exec command on the iframe targeting the font size command identifier. And we put size here in the value parameter. Now it's a very similar setup for allowing the user to change the font color or the color of items. So you can just make a var color that's equal to a prompt window that says define a basic color or apply a hexadecimal color code. And then you just take that color and apply it as the for color using exec command. And some people choose to put a color picker. There's a lot of free JavaScript color pickers out there. You can create your own color picker if you like. But for this basic one, I'm just going to use a prompt once again to take in some kind of value. So the user can type in gray, blue, silver, gold. They can type in all those basic words for a color. And they can also put in a hexadecimal color code for advanced coloring. Now, let's make the horizontal rule function work. You can see that's very much the same as the others up top. We're using the exec command method and the insert horizontal rule command identifier. Now the unordered list and ordered list is very much the same. I told you guys this was easy. We're going to run exec command insert ordered list as the command identifier. And we're going to give that a value. The name of that list is going to be new ol, new ordered list. The i ordered list function, same thing. Now for the i link function, we're going to do a similar thing that we did up here using a variable and a prompt window. So we're going to use a link URL variable that's going to be equal to a prompt window where they enter in the URL for the link they want to make. Then you use that link URL as the value parameter for the create link command identifier of the exec command method. Now the i unlink is very simple. You just run the unlink command identifier with the value of null. Now for the function i image, I chose to put in another prompt window that's going to allow them to put in the image location. And that's stored into a variable called image source. But this time I put in an if condition statement that says if the image source is not equal to nothing, that means if the value is actually there, then we're going to use the insert image command identifier with the value of image source. So that's just a little quick example of how you can check for null values before you actually run an exec command. Okay, now this last function was a little bit tricky to assemble and you guys better thank me for this crap because it's just not so easily thrown out there in any documentation that I found anywhere on the web. So here you go. What we're going to do is take the form and use document get element by ID on my form which is the name of the form that we're using. See name my form ID my form. So now we have a variable called the form, which is an identifier for that element. Now what I had to do to target the text field, I wanted to take the value of the iframe and place it into the text area. That way my form can process like normal when it submits. So I said the form dot elements and I targeted my text area, which is that hidden text area that's hiding and really it's just sitting and waiting in your form for when the form gets submit because right at that very moment when the form gets submit you take the contents of this rich text field and you place it into this my text area then you submit the form and everything works like a normal form would so that's why we're doing this here we're targeting the my text area dot value and we're making it equal to what's in the iframes rich text field iframe and I had to use window.frames rich text field dot document dot body dot inner HTML to grab all the data that's within the iframe and place it into the text area. It seemed like such a simple thing to do, but it really it took me like 30 minutes, if not 45 minutes, to assemble 
this one line of code through trial and error. Then finally, the last thing, the last line of your WYSIWYG to make everything work is the form dot submit. And that's how you actually submit your HTML form goes to myparsefile.php like it normally would in the action. But you're able to use some JavaScript, throw in a couple of lines there to put the value of this iframes, all the HTML text that's in that iframe you pop that into the my text area real quick and then you submit the form that's why we're submitting the form through JavaScript that way we can do that little bit of trickery at the end there you get it and that's how it works so now what you have when you combine index.html with WYSIWYG.js and myparsefile.php which all three of these scripts are going to be available from at developphp.com whenever I get these pages up I'm just going to have the full application source code under each video for this lesson series. That way nobody's like, where's the script, where's the script? I'm going to have the full script for everything under each video. So these scripts will be available at developphp.com when I get these pages up there. I'll have the index.html, the wysiwyg.js, and the myparsefile.php. Now, in video number three, which is going to be the final video of this lesson series, we're going to focus on this PHP file. We're going to talk about converting HTML tags to their HTML entities for security sake or just display sake. We're going to talk about filtering and we're going to talk about some database security. And then you should be good to go. But now try everything out because I'm not going to release the source code for until I get done with part three. So you guys can code yours out and you can see how easy it was to create this function. So you guys can code yours out by yourselves without having to copy my source code but if you're having trouble all you gotta do is wait a day or two and I'll finish video number three and we'll have everything all the script and source files available at developphp.com in the JavaScript video tutorial section